I think of myself as an abstract painter, but I want to use imagery so I can keep an interest in it rather than just say painting, uh, you know, brush strokes or something. I would think after 30 years you wouldn't want to paint brush strokes anymore. You know it's a sultan when you see it. You would never mistake it for anybody but Donald. That's the thing that Donald has. Rilke once wrote that the artistic experience was very close to that of sex and its ecstasy and pain, a different form of the same longing and joy. I think that's right, Sultan has said, and there is a sensuality in the paintings that seems to confirm this. Paintings have a life of their own, so in a way, once they're done, they have to convince you that they're as good as they are. So you make them and then they speak back to you. He has some answers, you know, <laughs> which is very nice. You know, it's nice to see that they're there. Most people, I would say, look at a painting five or six seconds in their life, any one painting. So the paintings have to have some kind of impact within a very short time to stay in the memory and have somebody really want to go back and look at it. You know, you don't really put together a gallery show per se. You just make the paintings and then that makes the show. I don't have an overall concept of how I want the show to look. I guess the stresses are just the general stresses of making art anyways. A show doesn't really add that many more stresses. In fact, it's nice to know you have some way to get them out of here so that, you know, hopefully they won't come back and you can start the next one. You don't want piles of stuff everywhere, but uh, the stress is between you and the work. The other things are somebody else's worry. Well, what to do from the next painting, how to do that, how to break that, how to use that color differently, how to make those work out. Should I change this this way? Should I do a bigger scale, smaller scale? Should I make any more of these things or should I do that? What, what do I want to do in the prints? The, the fact of having a show is another one, but mainly you, you want the experience to be a good one. And that's, of course, somewhat out of your control. <laughs> The deadline of finishing the paintings has got to be within now the next couple of weeks because the catalog has to be prepared, the photography has to be done, the essay has to be written. It's being written by Jim Salter, who's a wonderful writer. There's a natural affinity between painters and writers. Donald Sutton asked me to write the catalog copy for uh, this forthcoming show of his, and uh, I thought to myself, oh my God, do I know enough to uh, do this, uh, well, I said yes. And we assume a painter sees things in a different way than we do. They're responsive to and conscious of things that you are, that a normal person is not. They see how the light falls on certain things. Have they been there for a while? Well, last year I remember seeing, but not like that. Love that. <laughs> what began as a very natural, vibrant, I mean brimming with life series of paintings uh, has become much more industrialized and almost seems to be conceptual in a way in a comment on, uh, on what we are now offered or what we now have in life. These alleys are beautiful, look out. Just fantastic. I mean, almost all the architectural uh, paintings I made came from here. Building canyon paintings and all the uh, fire paintings with all the different fire escapes illuminated from fire and smoke. Look at the hats. The hats here. Could easily be that flower painting, right? They're all fuzzy and all the different colors. moved to New York when I was an artist in 1975, full-time. In the 1970s, there were a variety of reactions against minimalist abstraction in which artists really tried to pare art down to its very essentials. Donald fits into that particular 
particular direction in American art. Donald's work emerged in the new images group of artists that happened in the mid to late 70s. There were a lot of artists working with imagery in new ways. I did a show at Artist Space and had a big review in the Times. Also a show at Mary Boone's and one at Willard. And it all started to pick up from there. I started seeing Donald's work in the early 80s. And, uh, you know, that was, that was a period when uh, it was the end of the domination of the big isms of abstract expressionism and pop and minimal. And out of all of these people who emerged in the late 70s and the 80s, I thought Donald was one of the most original. I remember the early work as really being unusual, and there was a kind of sense of humor attached to it. He was using this strange kind of rough industrial material and applying it to extremely refined images. There were, there were images that were not ingratiating, but they, uh, they lodged in the mind and stayed there. What he's trying to do is create a different way of seeing things. Each show he's ever done it is the best show he's ever done. He's maintained a level of quality and authenticity and honesty that's just hard to, to, to imagine. The large painting that has all the different flowers on it, there's something completely different happening in that. And I, I wonder, if it, it's almost as if it's fabric. I, it's, it's as if he's sewn them on, and you know he hasn't. Really imprints on your mind. Adano seems like one of these artists on whom nothing is wasted. He can learn from everything and not be overwhelmed by it. This color I'm putting down is the glue for the flocking. Flocking is used for, was a, it was an uh, invention, like linoleum was a fake marble. Flocking was an invention to be a fake velvet. Uh, there is a deadline and it just makes everybody crazy. You know, you want to be able to do it right. I want them to be right and if it's a little late, everybody will just have to, you know, freak out. <laughs> Having studio assistants in American art is not that old. It starts probably with pop artists, uh, Rauschenberg and Warhol and John, people who, especially that used a lot of materials, art and technology and things like that, started bringing more people in. Well, you can see what Josh does, which is everything. And you can see what Jim does. He, he talks to Josh while he does most of everything. And Blake just started, she's an intern. And actually everybody does everything. We put them to work right away. They chip out the colors, they clean the surface, they set the plaster, sanding. I went to various studios when I first got here. I didn't really think that half of the people that live and work in New York actually walked on the earth. You know, they're kind of legendary status when you're in school. And so to a certain extent I was in awe a little bit. It's, it's definitely strange, just the whole process and the way everything is done. It's, it's nothing like I ever thought you know, art could be from when I had studied when I was in school. This is the spackling. This is the tar. We'll sand these off. These are just about ready. We'll lay it flat, reclean the tar, mask it off for painting. The top half is going to be black and the bottom half will be blue. I don't know why I like to get away from the city, but I do sometimes. The rain pots were part of a series of sculpture I did in 1990, in which the weight of the interior and the exterior was examined. 
So each of these pots is over a ton and the water in them is also very heavy. I think they're 2,200 pounds, but they have a serenity the way they sit that I find extremely beautiful. The first floor tile works I did in the 70s were landscapes, and I just put blue floor tiles together with gray ones, and I had the sea and the sky. One of the mainstays of making art is that you don't think up new ideas, you discover them. So that's why you have to work all the time. If you go out and just lie around, you know, and start thinking and waiting, you know, nothing is ever going to happen. And the longer you wait, the more you realize that when you come back to it, you're right back where you were. You're not any further along, even though you thought and thought and thought. You didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> I have to go to every opening. I have to go to every museum opening, every group show. Everywhere my work is, I should be there to support it. What happens if you start studying a particular kind of drawing, like cartooning per se, or illustration too much, then uh, the line and the, the, work, the way you work tends to become more like other drawings like that. It's a craft rather than an, an art. And it's kind of the hardest thing for people to do because the thing that most people are afraid of is the them, the uniqueness of their drawing. So you immediately, when you start, try to make it better, with better being more like other drawings that people say are good. So when you're drawing something, you're not drawing the thing per se, but the idea you want to express about that thing. And you're discovering it because you don't know it already. These are really just taking uh, sticker dots and putting them down and drawing the leaves over them, spraying them. And uh, I really got fascinated with these because of the delicacy of the different colors of the paper. It's, there's no other, the, the dots are formed only by the paper. There's no pigment in it. So it gave me this idea of, of making this kind of musical floral. The leaves are gestural. They're, they're not drawn so much as they are sort of smudged. And you don't know. Sometimes you think, well, I should have used more, I should have used less. You just don't know. There's a lot of that goes on underneath there. I kept shuffling the dots from the dice, the centers, the morning glories. They just keep getting shuffled around to where now they're the subject in the end, rather than the centers of another subject. I don't think it should be centered. Well, the, once the square's gone, you're not going to notice that, see? But if I'm going to center, maybe I should put a stem top and bottom and anchor it. Once you find a form you like, it's not really about the drawing per se of each one being different. The interest in this for me right now is the difference in a mechanical process. I mean, it's, it's always going to be different, so you don't have to worry about that. And fiddling with the aesthetics of it, of whether this should be here, or that should be over there, should I move it a little to the left, a little to the right? I mean, you know, after a while, that's kind of boring. What we're doing now, basically, since I'm doing a color chart, it has to be mechanical, because that's what a color chart is. And the reason I'm using flowers is because you don't tend to think of those as being mechanical. I started with that with the lemons. I, uh, the first lemons I did, they, you know, I was doing them, and uh, each time I drew a new lemon on the paper, the big big black ones and so I would play with the nipples on either end and then but what happened is people started thinking they were breasts and you know I wasn't really shooting for that there was a little bit of that but that wasn't the main thing so then I took one that I liked and I just traced it and I used that for every other drawing for the next two years they were all traced off the same lemon much like you go to see a sun-kissed lemon a real one that's just a, it's a form they don't they don't use them like you find them on a tree. They're manufactured lemons, which is kind of what I was after, the, the, the way we've, we've dumbed down 
all of our stuff to being the same so that people don't have choices well, they don't want choices. They don't want a weird looking lemon. They want a lemon that looks like a lemon. So that's what I was aiming for, the standardization industry of food, basically. So you take something mechanical and you use an image that's not mechanical and then you, you're gonna flock it, which is very mechanical. And at the end, we'll see what happens. I don't know what it's gonna look like. It could look pretty weird, <laughs> I have no idea. So we'll cut out the centers first and make those hard enamel and then the, the flowers will be soft. Now the question I haven't decided yet is do I carry the stems through like on the other ones and connect them all or leave them as single flowers and I won't know that until we erase the grid and look at them. So I've never done one like this before it's all a guess. I don't think I ever had the blackboard duty. <laughs> that looks good. I'll make him jump around. See how abstract that gets all of a sudden? When you see those all different colors, it's not gonna be clear exactly what the hell you're looking at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see, now that the structure's gone underneath of the grid, they're all, all the little differences are starting to pop out. <laughs> Absolute Vodka had a wonderful campaign where they asked contemporary artists to make paintings with an absolute bottle in it somewhere. They asked me to make one. I said I would. I had been doing little tomatoes and eggs, black eggs, so I decided to keep the same turning of the paint. And I made the olives and then I put in the pimentos because of martinis, which is one of my drinks. And I decided to put this bottle in as a photo silk screen because the very first person asked to do an absolute vodka ad in the beginning was Warhol and I wanted to do a kind of a bring it back to that original concept and I used the same techniques that Andy used and that completed the cycle. Part of my work is industrial and uh, I love the idea of the crossovers between using objects that are art and making the art an object and, and that you don't have to be precious with. You can hold it and have it and it's not something ordinary. It's not like a toothbrush holder or anything like that. I thought that I would like to make a scent because uh, of all the implications of perfume and Neiman Marcus just happened to call out of the blue and they said they wanted to use my images for their bags and some gifts and for a bunch of things that they wanted to do for a year of promotion of their store. And I said I would let them use the image and we could do it if they would back the perfume. So they said, okay. I didn't realize really quite what was involved in it. Really all I wanted was the bottle, the name Turpentine, and that was it. But as we developed it and got into it, the word Turpentine for most perfume people became problematical. And I said, well, uh, I'm not changing the name Turpentine. So that's, they put it out as Turpentine. <laughs> I decided to make it a paint box. This swings up like an easel, and you have the portfolio, and you have a limited edition print, which was uh, red poppies. And the mold that we use to make the bottle is just a plaster sculpture, so you have a little sculpture. You have a whole little set here, but you can use it. Uh, the price is $2,500. Yes, they sold. In 1999, I was approached by a man to do a hotel in Budapest that was going to be devoted exclusively to the art of one artist. So I did over 700 works, including the dishes, the carpeting, bathrooms, the colors of the fabrics, prints, drawings, plates, and uh, the hotel exists. It's called the Donald Sultan Art Hotel in Budapest. Why Budapest? <laughs> I don't know.
The grid is, is the structures that we walk in, we live in, and uh, it's a pictorial device. Yeah, I don't, am I off the edge over there? See, I, I can't see. I think you're over just a tad. Once that's up, all those squares are up. Then we have to take the flower and we have to fit it in there. So, so see how big the flowers are gonna be right in here. They won't be that small. See, this grid won't be there when we finish the painting. You won't see the grid. You'll only see the flowers. I first met Donald in 1975. One of the things that is interesting to me about Donald's work is his use of visually accessible, identifiable subjects such as flowers, industrial blight, landscape, smoke rings. It's all something you can actually see. But he uses it in the service of contemporary ideas about painting. He has the ability and the need to have things a very specific way which is very good in painting because a color tone or a surface quality is something that's 